morning, Madam Manu, from the Doctors Without Borders Association. You're in charge of a project that you called Antibioga. And I suggest that we look at a few pictures that illustrate this project. In RCA, the activities of bacteriology of MSF have commencé in 2019. We had the chance to be able to recruit super techniciens de laboratoire, mais on, on a, comme dans tous les pays, des difficultés à recruter des microbiologistes. Ici, au niveau du pays, il n'y a que sept biologistes disponibles au niveau national et la plupart sont concentrés au niveau des centres hospitalo-universitaires et donc pas disponibles pour tous les laboratoires de bactériologie. Et on n'a pas assez de laboratoires de microbio. Et c'est le laboratoire de la microbiologie qui, qui sont en centre sont logés dans la capitale. Donc tout le reste de l'arrière pays est sans laboratoire de la microbio. Déjà, en ACK, il faut rappeler, on a un laboratoire de la microbiologie qu'on a installé depuis 2019. C'est un outil qui va beaucoup, amener beaucoup de précisions, beaucoup d'informations aux praticiens. Et ça va beaucoup nous aider aussi dans nos, nos discussions de tous les jours. Voilà. D'abord, dans l'interprétation, il y a des règles que nous, en tant que techniciens, nous ne sommes pas en position. C'est normalement, c'est un microbiologiste qui doit interpréter les résultats. Mais avec l'antibiogo, même avec l'absence d'un microbiologiste, on peut déjà interpréter les résultats. Et c'est la V1, 5 routines. Ça va permettre d'améliorer la qualité euh, des euh, tests bactériologiques qu'on fait ici euh, à l'hôpital euh, SICA, puisque les techniciens de laboratoire ne sont pas formés à faire l'interprétation euh, de ces tests. Et grâce à Antibiogo, euh, on va pouvoir apporter euh, cette interprétation. Et donc les cliniciens vont recevoir un résultat euh, directement utilisable pour traiter les patients. En termes de, de ratio médecin-patient, nous, en Centrafrique, on a un très, très, très bas ratio. Donc, le plus souvent, les patients, ils, 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 se, ils se lancent dans une automédication. Il n'y a pas de réglementation pour leur vente des antibiotiques. Ce qui est assez impressionnant euh, quand on regarde les patients qu'on reçoit à l'hôpital SICA, c'est euh, le taux de résistance. Donc on a un, un nombre très important de bactéries multirésistantes, avec parfois des patients infectés par euh, deux, trois euh, bactéries. À SICA, le plus souvent, on a beaucoup de patients qui sont infectés. On a beaucoup de cas d'infection osseuse, beaucoup de, 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 de péritonite et de grosses infections des parties mortes. Et donc, avoir un bon, un bon diagnostic microbiologique, ça, ça va permettre à ce qu'on puisse, dans un bref délai, mettre l'antibiotique qu'il faut. Et donc, du coup, en général, on va raccourcir la durée de moins de chez eux, de, de, de chez eux à l'hôpital. On va être efficace dans nos prises en charge et généralement, diminuer euh, la mortalité. On reçoit l'antibiogue avec beaucoup d'intérêt parce qu'on a régulièrement des discussions sur euh, les antibiotiques à utiliser, les antibiotiques par déduction. Et là, l'antibiogue euh, nous donne tout ça. Et l'objectif, bien sûr, en 2023, c'est de pouvoir donner euh, accès euh, à, à un plus large nombre de laboratoires euh, non MSF à l'application. On espère qu'en euh, mettant à disposition Antibiogo plus largement dans différents pays, euh, ça permettra de démocratiser l'accès à des laboratoires de bactériologie, surtout au niveau régional et au niveau périphérique, puisqu'aujourd'hui, hélas, euh, la couverture euh, de la population au niveau du diagnostic bactériologique et de la résistance aux antimicrobiens, elle est principalement au niveau des capitales. Et ça, c'est pas seulement en RCA, mais euh, dans la plupart des pays dans lesquels un MSF intervient. Voilà, pour ce, pour ce projet en so, anti-biogo, uh, c'est toujours uh, bien d'avoir anti des images utiles. Uh, C'est toujours bien d'avoir des images utiles. Je vous laisse la parole pour ce que c'est vraiment ce que c'est. Donc, nous allons laisser le floor pour vous ajouter vos commentaires sur ce projet. Merci beaucoup. Tout d'abord, je voudrais commencer par remercier nos like collègues de la Fondation Pierre Fabre pour vous donner l'opportunité de partager vos expériences avec vous. Je veux juste revenir à ce que vous avez dit. Je veux juste revenir à ce que vous avez dit the fact that antibiogo was not developed in RCA. It was the end of the development process because today antibiogo is a, a certified medical system and the RCA is part of the countries where antibiogo is uh, used um, to uh, process patients. To come back to the idea of this tool, 
and the, all of the questions around the use of different technologies, um, among which AI. And it was interesting to listen to the roundtable because all of these questions that were raised were questions that we were faced with in recent years within MSF and the MSF Foundation. Big questions about the choice of technologies, so not necessarily AI, but to remain open as to what technology is and which met our needs the best. I think that that was what was very interesting. You always have to set off from the problem itself. And even though AI in recent years has it been a buzzword with everything that can contribute to diagnosis, it is not necessarily the technology that will best meet the need identified. So to come back to the birth of Antibiogo and uh, the questions that we raised and the, uh, uh, the lessons that we wish to share and to use to develop other diagnoses, we can just look at, uh, quickly at the question that we were trying to solve with Antibiogo, and that is antimicrobial resistance. We know that antimicrobial resistance today is a public health challenge, and we know that if there is no coordinated action, by 2050, there will be 2 million deaths per uh, year caused by resistance to uh, antibiotics. And uh, we think that this situation has been ex exacerbated. And the solution to antimicrobial resistance is, of course, um, multi are of course, multiple, and that's one of the difficulties. But if we set off from human health, that is what we're looking at in MSF, there are three possible axes. There's the fact of training uh, physicians to use uh, antibiotics rationally to improve hygiene and infection control, and finally, to allow clinicians uh, to... Uh, use antibiotics uh, 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 through using an, uh, antimicrobial tests in order to target the antibiotics. So we need human resources for this. One very striking figure that uh, was confirmed in MSF this year is that in Af sub-Saharan African, for example, if we want a ratio of microbiologists Compared to the population, we need to uh, wait for <coughs> decades to increase the ratio. In MSF, I'm sorry, the sound is very bad. So there are uh, uh, patients with multi-resistant bacteria. For example, in Jordan, we have 60 to 70 percent patients that are infected by at least one uh, resistant bacteria. We can also see this in our pediatric uh, projects, uh, for example, in Mali or Nigeria. There are many children with infections and uh, malnutrition and bacterial co-infection with multi-resistant bacteria. Unfortunately, for years, as we had no access to microbiology labs, it was a real blind stop. And we didn't know or what the level of resistance was. So for many years uh, in Médecins Sans Frontières, we, we set up microbiology labs, first of all to diagnose the patients, and then to collect data and document things, and to identify which antibiotics we could or no longer use uh, during the first year for pediatrics or uh, patients with septic conditions. So very quickly, we won't go into the details of the bacteriological diagnosis, but when a clinician inspect a, a patient, they take the sample, send it to the lab, it will be incubated, we see if there's a bacteria or not, and if there's a bacteria, one of the most important tests is the antibiogram. That is the test that allows us to list for the clinician the list of antibiotics that they can use and those that they cannot use as the bacteria has developed uh, resistance towards those antibiotics, and that's what... Uh, that, that's what we call an antibiogram. So the difficulty that it is measured by a lab technician in, in the lab and the final interpretation must be done by a microbiologist. And these resources, unfortunately, are not available. An antibiogram is, this is what it looks like. They're bacteria and there are antibiotic discs. The white discs are in... Uh, uh, there is antibiotic on them. If the bacteria is sensitive, it does not grow on this culture. If it is resistant, the uh, uh, presence of the antibiotic doesn't disturb it and it will continue to grow. So the first uh, step to m and read an antibiogram is to measure the diameters here and to compare them to threshold values 
uh, from, for example, European or American uh, microbiology societies. And a lot of people think that that's where interpretation stops. Well, we compared 22 millimeter diameter. That is below the, the threshold of 26, therefore it's resistant. If the diameter is 30, which is higher to the threshold, then it's sensitive. And we consider that the interpretation is over. But no, it's a little bit more complicated than that. There are thousands of rules which uh, give the parallel between what is happened in the Petri dish and what happens in vivo in the human's body during treatment. And I often give this example of this antibiogram. There are a number of antibiotics, so gentamicin and tepramycin, which were part of the same family of antibiotics. And... Uh, uh, we can measure the di diameters, we compare to target values, um, and, we, and we give this result to the clinician, but it's wrong because the rule for interpretation says that if acetomycin is resistant, even if we see a large diameter in the dish, uh, the probability of therapeutical failure is, 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 is there, and so we shouldn't use it anyway. <coughs> So with antibiogo, it's a very simple tool to try to overcome the uh, lack of a microbiologist by using an application which, when we take a photo of the antibiogram, it can do this interpretation. Antibiogo exists now. You don't need an interconnection. Internet connection. It is autonomous. Uh, the uh, digital code will be open source, and the idea is to help the lab technicians to interpret antimigrams if there are no antimicrobiologists. It's very simple. You take a photo. The first part is just the uh, rec image recognition that will help the lab technician to measure the uh, inhibition zones. It's a semi-automatic measurement, and that was very important for us to, uh, to make sure that the uh, lab technicians' own responsibility. They have to improve everything that is identified by the application. Artificial intelligence is only used on that part to identify the uh, names of the antibiotics because, of course, uh, manufacturers have different codes uh, for a different uh, for amoxicillin, for example. That can have four or five different names. And therefore, we entered in, in the model the different brands of antibiotics to suggest the right name to the lab technician, who, of course, remains responsible for approving this measurement and the name of the antibiotic. Then all of this information is sent to an expert clinician. That's the heart of uh, the application. This uh, expert system contains uh, numerous rules for European or American uh, microbiology. And with the input, the expert system applies the rules and gives uh, interpreted results as if it was a microbiologist. <coughs> we can therefore give a, 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 a quality result to the clinician. Of course, we have developed a result format that is easy to understand for the clinician. And antibiogo, uh, uh, the first user is the lab technician, but the end purpose is to give a result for uh, the prescription for the clinicians. Therefore, it's important to include the tech clinician in the loop of the design and development of the application to make sure that the final result will be used in the right way by uh, the uh, physicians. So antibiogo is a diagnostic test, but as we also wanted to grow the capacity of lab technicians whilst they used antibiogo, we didn't want to have blind lab technicians um, who just um, did never question the application. Uh, we also developed training tools, uh, so certain interpretation rules can be shown to the user, therefore the user can understand why it went from sen uh, sensitive to resistant. And as we also want to improve the quality of data, first of all for the patients, but then for uh, surveillance, we developed surveillance functions that uh, share this data with tools such as the data collection tool of the WHO and uh, the uh, WHO surveillance system. So we quickly understood that Antibiogo was not just a simple application, but that it was a medical uh, device. And uh, I have a lot of questions, actually, for people who were speaking in the first round table. 
on retinopathy and the questions of regulations, uh, which uh, I'm very interested in because we very quickly came up against the fact that uh, when an application yielded a result that had an impact on the medical decision, it was considered to be a medical device. And therefore, it had to be thought, developed, and tested and implemented according to the uh, norms developed by the European Commission with regard to medical devices. And therefore, uh, that's a lot of constraints uh, regarding clinical evaluation. So we carried out clinical evaluations, and this was brings us back to the discussion of the roundtable. All of the studies went through national uh, screening in collaboration uh, uh, with the countries and in agreement with them, be it with regard to collection of phot photographs or the studies themselves. In Mali, there was a pediatric site uh, of the MSF in Jordan. It is a hospital where we receive people injured in the war with very high resistance. Um, and in Senegal, it was in collaboration with the Pasteur Institute of Dakar, where, they had, uh, where it was a living lab. The antibiograms were non-routine for to look after the patients, and there was another lab technician that took the antibiogram, that read it with antibiogram, and didn't show the results to the lab technician so that we didn't bias their routine uh, tests. And the photos, plus the measurement of diameters and interpretations, was put onto our server. We took the photos, all of the results of di antibiogra, uh, the antibiotics tested, the measurements, and that was sent to two microbiologists who were external to MSF, who'd never worked for MSF, and who did their own interpretations on the basis of the photos and the information on diameter. Then we compared the uh, concordance between the interpretation uh, done by antibiogra and the interpretation by our two microbiologists as gold standards. We obtained a uh, concordance of 90%, and for the 10% of non-concordance, it was interesting to see that when we did a third reading, ten, the majority of the discordance was linked to the microbiologist rather than to the application. We therefore managed to finalize our regulatory file for European approval, and in May of last year, we obtained the CE approval, uh, which uh, showed that the application was developed and tested according to, uh, and to, which guarantees that it gives reliable results for the patient. So for the first time in the history of MSF, uh, MSF is become a legal center for a diagnostics test. Today, we've come a long way because antibiogo is uh, used routinely in six countries, Yemen, Jordan, Mali, uh, FCA, uh, RDC, and we are currently implementing it in Gaza. And uh, since September 2023, we've been working with the Ministry of Health uh, with the objective of equipping all of the uh, ministry's health labs at the national level with antibiogo uh, by the end of December 2023. When we carried out an analysis, and that is also a regulatory obligation, of uh, antibiogos' performance in uh, normal using conditions, we realized that 85% uh, of antibiograms were uh, corrected with, uh, with this tool, which was not the case when the lab technicians didn't have access to it. So we uh, asked ourselves a lot of questions around AI, uh, mainly regarding the regulatory aspect of things. We uh, could have developed an algorithm to directly interpret the antibiograms. We decided not to do this. We decided that the expert system, which is an old uh, but very robust technology and with which we have a lot of hindsight, could respond to this need of interpretation. We used AI uh, rather around the question of uh, recognition of the names of antibiotics and on measuring the diameters because it is something that uh, facilitates adoption. We realized with the lab technicians that if we ask them to m enter, the, enter the measurements manually, do the measurements and <coughs> enter it themselves and then uh, it's the expert system that did the interpretation. It was not something that helped the users to adopt the, this tool more easily. However, by providing the possibility 
of uh, having a faster reading. Not better because it's semi-automatic measurement, but a faster measurement. And uh, it was more pleasant to use as well. The lab technicians um, were far more engaged and actually used Antibiogo um, uh, and the, the expert system. So, regarding the databases that we used, so these data came from the countries in which Antibiogo is used. That was important for us that it be in Jordan, Mali or Senegal. We, uh, the question, ethical question is very important. Uh, with a lot of uh, ethical uh, committees of the country said yes, but uh, Nada, we need the patient consent. And the discussion was around does a bacteria uh, belong to a patient? Because an antibiogram is uh, an, an, an anonymous data by nature. There is no patient information. There is a list of antibiotics. There are bacteria that uh, have different aspects, but no patient data. And uh, the, the, this is a question that has not yet been answered. We're continuing to do our studies. We continue, continue to submit it to ethical committees. Some people can just give a great uh, examples, of, and they say that no, the bacteria cannot be directly linked to a patient. But others remain um, very attached to the uh, question of enlightened consent, even for bacteria. And the experience in Jordan, for example, showed that when we asked the patients the question, do you agree for us to take a photo of your bacteria? Well, in fact, there was a great deal of suspicion that was uh, it came about due to the fact that we asked this question because they didn't understand why we asked such a simple question. The most important thing for them was to have the list of antibiotics that they could take uh, for, for treatment. And uh, the, the question of what bacteria and what it looked like, for them, they didn't feel was relevant to ask consent. So regarding the training of the model, we had uh, some great performances. Nevertheless, we realized that the more uh, photos of different sites we added, uh, the performances were still good, but they were variable. And uh, that's what was interesting in the round table. It's quite true. Uh, photos taken in Paris, you will no doubt have a model with uh, performances that are close to 100%, but what is the most important is to take photos in real conditions with users who are not professional photographers and who are not used to using sophisticated cameras. In any case, Antibiogo, we asked them to take a photo with a simple a smartphone with 10 megapixels, which is the lowest resolution today for smartphones and cameras. We're also working on the question of prototypical federated machine learning. As there are all of these difficulties of data sharing between countries in order to have robust databases, in collaboration with the Polytechnic School of Lausanne, we developed a model <coughs> without that allowed each telephone without a, uh, an internet uh, connection to learn locally. So if an antibiotic is not detected by the initial model, the user can manually enter the name of this antibiotic, and the next time the application encounters it, it the model will have learnt <coughs> itself with the help of the user. So they won't need to re-enter the name. And this allows us to bring the user into the learning loop. And there is a possibility, well, once the different local telephones have learnt, there is the possibility, once we uh, bring in the internet connection, that this learning be uploaded to the central level for it to be approved and then dispatched back out to all of the other telephones. That is a big regulatory problem because there is, it's a total gray zone on when you send the improved uh, model and not the data to the central level, what happens? You approve it. How does the uh, validation work? And for a medical device that doesn't have the right to change uh, normally, unless you go through regulatory clinical trials, can we send back an improved model? Is it ethical to deprive the users of an improved quality of the model just because there is a lack of regulation? That's where we stand today. We are trying to document all of this so that we can 
uh, provide our arguments to the European Commission uh, regarding regulations around medical devices. Nevertheless, there, it is a, remains a grey zone. <coughs> what remains uh, the uh, the question of using AI remains very uh, important. Today, as a diag with a diagnostic tool, if uh, the artificial intelligence tool delays the marketing and the possibility of treating a patient and acting faster, the question is there. Should we opt for that technology? And is the added value of this technology sufficient for us to take the risk of delaying uh, uh, the marketing? And there's also a regulatory gray zone that is uh, stacking up, but which is changing every day with the legal constraints imposed, new legal constraints ah, imposed upon uh, uh, manufacturers. So this was a final example of an algorithm that we de uh, developed to identify resistance mechanisms. The model was good, but we realized that by doing this, the lab technician, we didn't ask them the question as to whether uh, they agreed when they saw this type of resistance, this type of synergy, the two photos on the right of the screen. Therefore, we decided not to include this model in the application to avoid removing the responsibility from the user, but to rather to develop a design that could support the user in detecting and recognizing this resistance mechanism. So uh, what were the lessons we learned within MSF and that we are trying to use to develop our diagnosis test? Uh, uh, so things such as uh, an algorithm to detect colon cancer. Uh, one of the questions we were asked was, will uh, artificial intelligence really m make the interpretation uh, better or easier? And we realized that given the fact that the expert system was far more robust for that part of the interpretation, when we remove the user from the loop and that we remove the responsibility from them, uh, we realized that that was not the best way of uh, um, having responsible users who were using tools with this type of technology. Then there's the regulatory question. Uh, is the added value of the technology far more important and worthwhile um, to take a, a, a regulatory risk of complexity and also uh, you know, the fact of being within this gray zone? And finally, when we looked at the variability of the antibiograms and above all the quality of the antibiograms from different sites and the impact on the model's performance, this confirmed our decision not to use AI for interpretation. And I will end by saying that we're very happy that European regulation and FDA imposes a lot of constraints around medical devices and the use of AI, because we want patients to be able to be treated with quality tools. And quality tools means tools developed ethically and uh, in compliance with uh, norms and standards. But the question today, and this is related to the question of the business model, is uh, as uh, w w for countries with res uh, limited resources, how can we guarantee that these tools, these algorithms will be available to them, but at a reasonable cost for uh, low-income uh, countries? And our experience with AntibioGo today is that it is the only uh, free medical device available, and we are approached by many companies because they're interested in buying or uh, us out or working with us in order to uh, put their hand, get their hands on antibiogo. But the biggest risk for MSF and the MSF Foundation is that th this tool would no longer be easily available to limited resource companies. So here I raise the question, oh, uh, AI will continue to evolve, regulation will continue to be increasingly constraining, which is a good thing for patients uh, and for me because we will bring things to market faster. But how can we guarantee that these uh, 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 devices will um, be uh, available to populations at a reasonable cost? Yes. Um, and uh, if there is a... Uh, and, uh, 
merci beaucoup, NFTs, merci uh, beaucoup, labs on will be ready to take that regulatory uh, risk that we're taking project, today. Thank you very much for this uh, project and the description of your Antibiogo project. And to close this morning's proceedings, as every year, one of these highlights of this event, and that is the uh, uh, 2023 awards.